Hello and welcome to the Bernina webinar today, the right thread for every sewing project. I am Julie Bridgman. I will be your moderator today and um, wanted to let you know that if you do have questions throughout the webinar, you can ask them in the questions pane. I will collect the questions and save them for our presenter to answer at the end of the presentation. Our presenter is Sylvain. He is a, an educator with Bernina of America. Welcome, Sylvain. Thank you, Julie. Yes, my, my name is Sylvain and I am a thread junkie. <laughs> so my last quilt had 4 million stitches of embroidery, abstract embroidery on the front. So I, I use thread, I love thread. So we thought we'd go over what makes thread work. Now, I have to give you the scoop for today. There isn't a right thread for every sewing project. The best thread is the one you like, as long as it's you know generally suitable, that you have tested, and then, then you just have fun with. So you can use threads that are supposedly not you know labeled for a certain use. You can use them on off-label use if you want. All you want, the key will be to test. But what I will do is I will show you what goes into thread and you know some of the key concepts the big one being thread weight that's like the great mystery um a lot of people me included are still confused sometimes when you meet a new thread like okay what what what's in there right and how do how does it work so i'll go through some of that i will be using material from metler metler is part of the aman group you may know them with isocord thread for instance polishing metler is a big german brand uh they actually partner with bernina they uh when you buy a brand new bernina there's a little bag with about three spools on the top of the box that is metal thread reason being both companies have a long history uh quality is very important to both companies and they basically uh work together because we uh, if you have a finely calibrated machine and a high quality thread that machine can execute perfection so uh some of the slides you'll see and i have a handout and talking of handouts there are three uh, one is, and let me show them to you, uh, one will be the slides, so let me, uh, let's see, yeah, the slides as you see here, you have that PDF to download. The next one will be a one page with some uh, useful links that will send you to uh, uh, accessories, thread uh, information uh, that you can follow up on, including a few blog posts on We Also, our blog, uh, that talk about thread and relate to thread. And then there is a, a, a little brochure from Metler that explains the history, what goes into that thread, and so on. And I'll be using some of that material today. So without further ado, let's jump in. First thing is you are here. If you think thread is confusing sometimes, this is why. And it, it's not you. It's, you know, even I've worked with a lot of thread, I understand generally, but once in a while I get stumped or I have to go look it up. If you learn one thing today is that when you see or hear of a thread, write the name down and then go to the manufacturer's website. They will have the best information and typically including recommended needle size that works well with that thread. It's not a hard fast rule, but it's a good place to start. So you have your sewing machine. It should be cleaned. Even if you don't use it, use it that often, your sewing machine should be cleaned at least once a year just like you change the oil on your car. Reason is, if a thread leaves lint behind, all threads leave a little bit of lint behind because there's friction, that lint disappears partly inside your machine. You don't know where it goes, you don't know what it does, right? A technician will clean that up before it becomes an issue. And also down below, you see lint more readily because when the needle punches through fabric, you, you'll see the lint below. The lint that you see in the bobbin area typically is from the fabric, not so much the thread. A good example would be you're stitching on flannel. Flannel has all, that, has all these little fuzzy fibers that are pretty much broken up already, and you'll get a nice little little sheet down there that is from the fabric, but some of it will be from the thread as well, and that will tend to accumulate upstairs in where the take-up lever especially is, where the thread goes through the guts of the machine. That's where lint will accumulate over the years if you don't clean it. So make sure you get your machine serviced every year, then every thread has a chance to work well. Now, there's the user, right? We uh, are using the right needle with the right thread. Make sure the needle is big enough, not too big, not too small, and the right type of needle, like a quilting needle when you quilt a quilt sandwich. And I use a sharp needle, which to, nowadays is called jeans when I piece my quilts. 
So using the right kind of needle, that's first thing. The needle delivers the thread. So all that thread information is for naught if the needle is not the right needle. So there's information about needles on the blog. We also as well. Now you'll gain experience with threads. And here's my only golden rule. If you've used that thread before, if you like it, it worked well for you, you know how to handle it. That's the best thread for the project right there. So, you know, somebody might say, I prefer a 30 weight cotton thread for quilting my quilt. Somebody else will say, I use Isocord 40 weight. We do actually use some of that on the long arms nowadays. And whichever you like, whichever gives you the results, the appearance, when you piece a quilt, when you quilt a quilt, when you make a garment, anything, if that works for you and you get predictable results, quality results, that's the right thread. What you know, what works is always the best look. So that is, um, you know, the thread design and the sewing parameters, those vary by project, by layers and so on. We'll go through some of that as we go through. So what we're going to touch on today is first thread types. And there's the, you know, the, the, the big dichotomy is natural fibers, typically cotton versus synthetic fibers, polyester, for instance. Right? Then we'll talk, we'll talk about thread weights. And thread weight is messy. And you know what? I understand thread weight. There's so many systems. I'll give you the, literally the rule of thumb, which means you'll run the thread between your, your two fingers, your index and your thumb, and feel the thread. That I still use that test to feel about the different qualities of a thread. Then uh, when threads are either balanced, the same thread needle and bobbin, let's say when you piece a quilt or make a shirt, uh, versus when threads are unbalanced. For instance, Libby Lehman, when she did all her filigree work on her quilts, she used a very super fine thread in the bobbin, right? Bottom line thread. It's very, very slick, very, very thin. Versus a thread that may be a more metallic finish or a slightly coarser on the top, you will have to play, there's a tug of war going on there, so you'll have to balance the equation. That's usually between the needle and the thread tension. So a little testing will be involved. So when that is done, let me deselect here. Okay, let's start with the raw material comparison. And as I go through this, you can see here natural fibers versus chemical fibers. That's German for basically synthetic, right? So think cotton versus poly. That brings up the question. And Julie, we have a poll. When you do basic seaming in general, let's say quilting, garments, uh, place masks, table runners, anything, do you use mostly cotton thread? for your sewing thread, or do you use a polyester thread? So we'll run the poll, and so that we'll have an idea. I have a guesstimate, but uh, this is, I have a statistician training in grad school, so I always like to go back and verify, and it'll be very interesting to see what the proportions are. Okay. Well, it's funny, it started out with, 75% cotton, but now polyester is is gaining ground. Gaining votes, gaining votes. So cotton is down to 58%. Okay, all right, but well, that's good. So let's say around 60% cotton. Uh, I, Julie can back me up on this. Before the before we started, I told her my guesstimate would be anywhere from 66 to 70, two thirds to three quarters, and uh, you know it started there. We, uh, polyester is gaining ground. Uh, we'll talk about this. So the, uh, when you look at cotton, cotton is a little more, uh, it can be a little more from matte to glossy, depending on how it's processed, right? Mercerized cotton can be uh, between matte and glossy, and there's some cottons a little shinier than others. Uh, the polyester thread, uh, basically, it, it varies. Polyester embroidery thread has more gloss. Polyester sewing thread doesn't. But the key is the breaking strength. You see that, and here the red doesn't mean negative. It means it was to draw attention. Cotton thread will snap sooner than polyester thread. Polyester thread is both stronger and it has some elasticity to it. Now, when I say elasticity, it means it can stretch. I don't mean it's elastic, like re rubber elastic. So if I show you a 50 weight thread, this is orophil cotton, and there's, you know, we have, uh, we have metler cotton. Right, and then we have polyester threads. The cotton thread typically, when you pull on it, doesn't stretch very much at all, and you, so it feels stronger at first because it start it start it will start resisting you 
and stop stretching early. Like you barely feel any stretch at all. And then eventually it will pop. Now the polyester thread, when you do polyester thread, it will stretch a little bit. It's not like it will stretch twice its length. It's very barely perceptible, but that will delay a little bit the popping point, you know, the breaking point. So it feels like it it feels like it it lasts longer and it you know it you don't feel as much pressure on your finger right away. That pressure is delayed. So it doesn't feel as strong sometimes. It's actually stronger because the the perception, the physical perception of the breaking point is delayed. You don't perceive it all at once, so your brain doesn't register it as strongly. So polyester thread is stronger, and I'm not you know I'm not saying you should all switch to polyester all the time, but it's, that's an important distinction. It is stronger, and it will take a temporary stretch, temporary strain, better without popping. Now, uh, and we'll we'll come back to that. So uh, elongation and abrasion resistance. Polyester, because it's a longer extruded fiber, right? It's not a cotton fiber. Cotton fibers have a certain length. You've heard of long staple, good quality cotton thread. That would be, that'd be Mettler, King Tut, and so on. They're long staple threads. And so those are stronger because they have these longer strands that are twisted together. Polyester is man-made, right? It's synthetic. So when the, when the fibers are created, you get long staple anyway, and then they're twisted together. And again, we'll come back to the, uh, in a couple of slides, you'll see the difference between the two. The dyeability, uh, which means how you can dye that thread, cotton will soak up dyes, and so you can get from light to dark. Polyester is not as compliant that way. So typically uh, on, a, on a cotton variety, variegated threads, a lot of this stuff is cotton. Okay, that's a nice property. Uh, color fastness, cotton will fade. The dye is absorbed in the cotton, the cellulose fibers but it is not part of the fiber itself. And linen thread, for instance, or linen garments, right? You know that linen doesn't take dye well because it's a very hard fiber. So natural fibers don't dye as well. And for dark colors, you have to saturate them. And the dark dyes is better nowadays, but they used to weaken the fibers, like an old spool of black thread would pop all the time compared to an old spool of natural cotton color or very light cotton, light cotton color. So Cotton, more color, bigger rainbow, but the color is more stable on a polyester thread. So that's, uh, and the light fastness. So I've mentioned in the previous webinar, if you're gonna sew for the outside, you're recovering, you're reupholstering or recovering your, your cushions for your patio furniture. You do not wanna use a cotton thread. Uh, cotton will degrade with the sun, it will weaken up, and the it will well the fade in the the thread itself is not so important, but the it will weaken the thread. So you want a synthetic fiber, and there are threads speci specifically designed for awnings for any kind of outdoor application. So if you want to do a very specific application that is not general sewing, if you want to get out of the off the beaten path, basically research online. Do an online search on you know uh, patio co uh, cushion covers. The, the, the needles and threads and fabrics to use and all that, you'll, you'll, you'll probably find a user group where you'll find tips as well that will save you time. But the light fastness and the color fastness is stronger on polyester as well. And the resistance to chemicals, um, you know, usually I don't throw nasty chemicals at my shirts, but basically if you had to bleach something, which I don't bleach anymore, I use like that oxy type uh, whitener if you want. I don't bleach because bleach leaves some of it in the clothes. I don't want that on my skin, right? But if you had to bleach stuff, the polyester thread is more uh, durable that way than the cotton. Bleach, if you were to pour pure bleach on a cotton garment, you'll get a hole. It will it will literally eat up the fibers. You know that, right? So if the, the thread on the cotton thread would suffer the same fate. So that's for general properties. That does not mean we don't use cotton thread. I asked my colleagues before this webinar, what do you use for basic seaming? Quilt piecing, for embroidery, for quilt stitch quilting, and uh, decorative stitching and all that. And they all gave me their, you know, their rules. And actually, more than half of my colleagues still use Aurifil cotton thread for piecing their quilt. My quilts are wall quilts. They're heavy because of the embroidery, stabilizers, and a whole bunch of materials in them. I use strictly polyester thread. So it's whatever thread has the ideal properties for the project. If I were to do a mug rug and I happen to have cotton, I usually have a stash of Mettler silk finish 50 weight. It's basically equivalent to the Aurifil thread, right? It's one or the other. I have a stash of Mettler thread. 
that's my go-to when I do a small project. But most of my C-Main nowadays is both polyester, and I'll revisit that in a bit. So thread types. So this, this is the best visual I've found. If you look at the construction of the thread, you have spun thread. This is your, you know, your typical sewing thread. So if you have spun thread, uh, it literally has little hairs all over the place, right? If you have coarse spun threads, uh, the way it's assembled, if you have a long staple thread, you'll see less of those little fuzzies sticking out. So a long staple cotton will do very well that way, just like a polyester. The polyester has a built-in advantage because it's an extruded fiber. You're not limited to what the cotton plant made for you. Right? And then you have continuous filament, which is actually those are bun smooth bundles. And I, I, in yellow here, I put examples on the metal palette of typical threads that match this. So the silk finished cotton has a spun thread. So every end of these little cotton fibers at both ends can stick out. Now, a good quality long staple cotton is not going to be an issue. But those little things will basically rub off gradually and you can get a bit of lint generated from a thread like that. It's normal. All threads, all natural fiber threads will generate a little bit of lint. A good thread is perfectly acceptable. If you see a lot of lint on the outside top of the machine, right where the tension discs are, that tells you that thread is either getting old or is linty. That's the best place to spot actually lintiness. Now, continuous filament, for instance, you have isoport, but in the middle you have metrocene. Metrocene is metallurgy's polyester thread. That's what I sew with. And there's a 50 weight, and there is a 60 weight, finer if you want. Finer thread means, let's say for quilt blocks, if you, uh, when you pull the fabric over in your seam allowances, that thread is, takes less bulk. So the wrap around over the seam allowance takes less turn to actually make it so it has less impact on your quilt block. So that's for a, a finer thread that is stronger will meet the same requirements of a 50 weight that was a little coarser. Right? So that's your silk finish versus metrocene. Uh, there's also bobbinet. It used to be called bobbin fill, fill being the French word for thread. So it was bobbin thread. And now they, they call it bobbinet. I don't know why, but that's the new name. So uh, that's, that's the, one of the other threads that matches that. Serralon is their serger thread. And we'll, I'll show you live samples of different threads in a bit. So uh, we'll talk about weights when we get there. Our machine is the same as isocord. If you do embroidery, you use isocord thread. Isocord pretty much introduced commercial uh, polyester 40 weight as a standard embroidery thread in the early 2000s. I was new uh, at Bernina when we went from uh, uh, rayon only embroidery thread to, uh, to isocord slash polyester. So isocord is up here. Now, when you talk about something like Sarah Flock, those are, it's like a woolly nylon. Woolly nylon is a brand of YLI. This is the equivalent here. Those are basically bundled, but fuzzy. They're not bound together, not twisted tight. So they fuzz up and they make a nice smooth layer. I use that to, uh, with an overlock to cover the edge of a flannel, do a flat edge to a flannel when I do baby blankets. When a friend of mine has a baby, that's my, the first present. So it's a very good for, thread for coverage. It works better in an overlock because of its fuzziness. Okay, now other thread types, you have monofilament. There's two main types nowadays. Uh, the, you're probably familiar with the YLI brand. Uh, they use nylon uh, monofilament, which tend to disappear very well. It stretches, like any monofilament, it stretches a little more than the other type, which is polyester. We use it uh, with success for the hand look stitch on our Bernina sewing machines. It imitates a hand quilting stitch by, it appears to be leaving a gap between the stitches, but just the way the stitches form. And it's also, that effect is also used for uh, faux sashiko when you do that on the surface. So there's nylon and there's also a polyester. For instance, Salki is the commonly carried brand of polyester monofilament. The advantage of polyester is that it will take heat. Nylon melts with heat. So if you do a project, you hem something with a very fine monofilament in nylon and you happen to put a hot iron at, on cotton or linen setting, you will melt your hem. It will disappear. You'll lose your stitches. So for me, for if if it's a seaming type of application, I will use the polyester monofilament rather than the nylon. There's nothing wrong with either of them. It's just that they have their best suited applications. Now, typically, you will be somewhat limited to the thread assortments offered in your local stores. 
But the plus side of that is that if they carry one brand over the other, they can tell you why and they give you the details. And again, the fallback is always you go back to the manufacturer's website and then you look at their specs on the thread, where they recommend the applications are, the size of the needle and all that. The, the horse's mouth is always the best place to find out about that particular thread. Now, there are wrap yarns. I'm not talking really about those today, but I will talk about, actually, there is a thread called Yen Met. It's a metallic. And when you talk about metallic threads, originally, they were filament. They were a metal filament. That is not thread. It's a filament. It's a little wire. It kinks. It is, you know, you have to use a thread mesh. You have to slow down. It will break easily, but it's pure gold, literally, pure metal on the surface of your fabric. It looks awesome. So you just have to make accommodations for the thread. Nowadays, we have something called Yen Met that is like an isochord polyester core. So flows well, strong, can go to high speed. I've even made standalone lace with it. Uh, there's one called pearlescent. It's like a mother of pearl effect. And you can use this for standalone lace in the bobbin and the needle. If you want to use this for embroidery, use a ballpoint needle. So it doesn't kink in the, the sharp, you don't have a sharp point kinking into the thread and cutting, snapping it. But the yen mat flows very well. So it has the performance of a polyester embroidery thread, but with the outside effect of a metallic. You do slow down, anything metallic, you slow down. That's from experience, right? If you try to sew it for high speed with a metallic, you'll learn very fast. Or if you want to go super high speed with a monofilament, you'll learn that it stretches, it doesn't behave well. You have to accommodate the nature of the thread to get the results you want. The key will be, and this is the, the golden rule for today. When you want to try a thread out, you've learned about it, or you want, you know, they told you it's the best thing for the effect, the application you want, take a piece of fabric, put a piece of stabilizer, underneath like embroidery stabilizer and then run a stitch on that fabric uh, a, fe a feather stitch is a good idea a honeycomb stitch a stitch that goes back and forth that gives you a little geometry and then run it run it slow run it fast you will see how it behaves on the fabric because thicker threads will tend to sit more on top of the fabric and show off more and then thinner threads tend to kind of flatten down closer to the fabric and are less of, of course because they're thinner will be less visible. So you get to see, do I want a 40 weight or 50 weight? There's nothing written in the Dead Sea Scrolls that you should use a certain weight of thread for a certain project. You want to use a very thick thread on the quilt or a very thin thread, it's really your deal. You just want to see it on a flat fabric first, call that auditioning or interviewing your thread. What do you look like? And then took it on to your, test it on your project. So that's for, that is for the thread types. Now for the thread weights, that is, it's a mess. There are different thread weight systems, and they they don't agree. They, you know, they have formulas. I've seen the table where you can convert between them. Mm. I like math. I like statistics. I even like calculus. But I didn't like that table. I don't want to do this. I don't, so I'll give you a rule of thumb to basically uh, go down on that. So thread weight. The definition of thread weight, like a 50 weight, a 60 weight. The smaller the number, the thicker the thread. That's the one thing to remember. Think, uh, it's not the same, but if it helps you remember, bed sheets. When you buy a 200, you know, like the, 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 the big marts, the 200 weight, or sorry, 200 count thread sheets, you know that's coarse compared to a thousand thread count, right? So that's not thread weight, it's thread count in a, in a bed sheet. But the smaller the number means heavier thread, and that's consistent. So the weight is how long the thread needs to be to weigh a kilogram. That's 2.2 pounds. Uh, this is where the metric system helps because if you have to do pounds and ounces and miles, it would not work. So a 50 weight thread is 50 kilometers of thread. That's about 30 miles to weigh a kilogram. Now don't count the spool, the plastic or wood spoon, right? No, no, just the thread itself. So that's a uh, long. Now, mind you, if you do uh, if you do like a million and a half stitches or, or, or on a quilt, like I just I did once uh, in the past, that's about a, it was about a mile and a half of isoport. You know, I was actually I calculate my quilts in miles. So that brings it back. So a 60 weight thread means you needed 60 kilometers. You needed 20 percent more thread to weigh the kilogram. That tells you that thread's finer, right? So that for thread weight, the official definition. Now there's a metric count, like Metler uses that. It's not the same as thread weight. It's akin, but not the same. 
So a uh, number 40 is basically how many meters of thread weigh one gram, as opposed to kilometers per, uh, per uh, kilogram. So it, the, the first number will be akin to thread weight. And then, uh, then sometimes you'll see a slash with a secondary number. The secondary number will be for the number of plies, number of strands twisted together in that thread. And three plies is stronger than two plies for the same weight. So if you had a 50 weight two and a 50 weight three, the three will be stronger on average than the two because there are more strands. If you look at the Golden Gate Bridge in California, there's a documentary, it's, it's available on YouTube, how it was built, it's amazing. When you see these big tubes that, you know, that support cables, those are wrappers, because inside it's a bunch of metal cables in a giant machine that twists all of those together like a giant ship rope, ship rope out of steel to make a giant cable. Thread is a microscopic version of that. So three plies better than two if it's a strength dependent application. If it's just piecing little quill blocks and there's a ton of seams in there, a two ply will be just fine. Okay. So text. Text is the weight in grams per thousand meters. So you'll see, you know, sometimes you see text numbers, not typically on spools, but it's there. I don't want you to remember any of those today. I just want you to get a feel for it that the small number is better. Denier is how many grams of thread per 9,000 meters. Who came up with that? I don't know, but it makes no sense. Now, you may have heard the word denier, not so much with thread, but with backpacks and heavy outdoor gear. Uh, it's, there's a fabric brand called Cordura. And when I remember there's different weights of denier Cordura, which means heavier backpack material, the stuff that you can't rip versus lighter weight for a day pack. That's, when, uh, that's where I first saw that name like 30, 40 years ago. Uh, now it's, it basically comes from the thread size that made it, that went into it. So those are the different. Remember one thing: small number, thicker thread. That's all you need to know. So a 30 weight thread is thicker than a 50, you know, or a 60, right? And a 40 is thicker than 50 by a little bit. All right. So that's for the weight. So the direct method, very straightforward. Visual test. This is a Mettler silk finish. I'm gonna put it close to the camera. 50 weight. This is an orophil, 50 weight cotton. They're both cotton. So these are basically the same thickness. And if I run between my thumb and my, my index finger, if I run between the two, they feel about the same. Okay? That that and if I put them against a white countertop, if it's not white thread, I can put them side by side. Yeah, they look pretty much the same. Now they're both good for all the applications they're rated for. Piecing a quilt. I have colleagues who sew garments out of this stuff. For me, garments, I'll go poly because the thread will take a temporary strain without popping. I don't like redoing seams. Uh, the old, old rule that you never sew a cotton fabric with polyester thread, uh, not 100% airtight. Uh, it's really, it, this is really, it applies to, let's say, a love quilt. If you do a quilt for, let's say, a crib quilt or a floor quilt, I have made one for my son and when he was a baby, it's going to get washed a lot, a lot of tugging. And then, so you probably want to use cotton thread on cotton quilts. So the, the thread, if, the, if anything pops, it would be the thread. It won't rip into the fabric. That old rule also was born when we had top loader machines, you know, with a big giant agitator in the middle that went like this. And it would yank that quilt and literally stress that quilt out. Uh, my mother once washed a cotton blanket in a good old Whirlpool top loader machine. Way, way, I was a little kid. And then she started, the machine started, the washing machine started dancing in the kitchen. It moved off the wall and it was jerking itself because the, 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 the blanket had bound around it. That's when you would rip everything out. Today we have front loaders. It's a gentle tumble. So that rule is not as airtight. You could use a polyester thread. If you do a lot of quilting stitch on top, everything is so locked down, it wouldn't matter as well. But if you want, if you want to, if you, if you are used to cotton thread, and this is what you've used all your life and it's worked for you, let's say if orophil is your thread of choice, if it works for you, do not change a thing. Me, I'm, a, I'm more of a polyester thread person based on pretty much all the work I, I do for myself when I'm not working. Uh, polyester is work for everything I do. Now, what I'm wearing today, I promise you what you're wearing today, unless if you made it yourself, is sewn with polyester thread. 
and I had to redo a, a seam on a thigh of a pair of pants. Uh, and in the summer, I wear bright colors. Those pants are red. I call them my Bermuda pants. And it was those the, the, the seam that popped. There was polyester thread. But most commercial garments are primarily sewn on an overlocker nowadays, and they do a chain stitch. So when a seam pops, it tends to stretch out and you open up really fast because it's a chain stitch. That's that flower sack stitch. And if you pop a chain, it will try to rip out. I do not remember a garment popping stitches, uh, you know, and ripping the garment, you know, cutting the cotton, even though it was sewn with polyester thread. So that rule is, is not what it used to be. So it's to be taken with a grain of salt. So the visual test is side by side, put your threads. And if your, your base thread is 10, for most people is a 50 weight, your finger develops a feel and the stretch and pop test that you develop a feel for that as well. And if you put a 30 weight thread next to that, or even a 40 weight, you will see the difference. You know, even if it's not written, the sticker is gone off your spool, you'll see, okay, that's thicker. If you know your brand of thread, isocord is always 40 weight polyester. That's a given. Serger thread tends to be 70 weight. Right, and some of, they used to write more of the weight. Now nowadays, not so much. Now they'll just call the brand name and the article number. But you can go to the manufacturer's website and see what the numbers are on that. Feel test the rule of thumb: just glide over the thread. And if you want to see the quality of the thread, you you pinch it with your fingernails. And every slub will put a little jerk on your fingernail. And so you'll see how smooth that thread is. And versus you know, and if it's bargain bin thread you your mama your grandma everybody's warned you stay away stay away thread is uh thread is everything is the construction principle uh, needle and thread is what will make the garment the quilt the project come out right so don't skimp on those never never skimp on those and if you have old natural fiber spools the wooden spool from grandma's attic it's dead the fibers have weakened over time, cotton will degrade over time, and that thread will not hold once it's in, even once it's in the project. So it's cool, like you know, maybe a little wall rack just for you know as a decoration. I would not, I would not use natural fibers. Now I love silk thread, I love cotton thread, but fresh. And we'll talk about storage before the end. Okay. So the field test and then the pull test. If you have a, 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 a polyester thread, typically will keep its strength. A natural fiber is more important. If you uh, calibrate your own brain, I do this all the time. I don't trust myself. This is a cotton thread. I will pull. Okay, snapped. That was pretty much what I remember, but I don't have a gram meter up here. So it's a feely, feely type of thing. Then I go to, and if I have a spool that I know I've had for a long time, I stretch it. And if it pops a little sooner than that, oops, try again. And then you'll know. If it really pops sooner, you'll notice the second time. A uh, good example. Metler doesn't have it anymore because it didn't sell anymore, but we used to have GIMP in white and black. I would use this as a gathering cord all the time because it was really, really good and it was, it was smooth and it went through. There was a white and a black. I have an old, old spool of white and black because we haven't had it for a long time now. And the black stuff, because it's a natural fiber, that was cotton, the, the dyes over time have degraded the cotton. And the black stuff now pops very easily, so I can't use it anymore. I just you know, I still have it, but I, I could couch it, but I will not use it for structural purposes. Uh, embroidery thread, rayon, dark colors, uh, black rayon embroidery thread. If your thread is not fresh, you know, not recent, it would snap all the time. So that's one thing with natural fibers you have to pay attention to. Silk thread tends to be stronger because the, the strands, the fibers are longer in silk because a cocoon is one continuous a strand so you have these nice long fibers silk thread is stronger than cotton it's a more expensive as sheen as properties but it, it's less uh, vulnerable to uh, degradation over time okay and when i say over time a year two years no biggie 20 years check on your thread okay so that's four fibers so now when threads when you form a stitch there are two threads involved on your on your whole machine right so whether it's a domestic machine or a long arm, doesn't matter. Embroidery, sewing, anything. So by for seaming, we tend to balance the threads. That's easy. We just, you know, and then you can check your tension. Remember one thing though. When your machine sews, the needle goes down. It's delivering the thread downstairs. The bobbin thread has less work to do. It's the needle thread that will loop around the bobbin case by the hook, then picked up with the, uh, the take-up lever. 
And I, I did a video on the, when we did the needle webinar that, you know, it's well over a dozen times. It could be actually 40 stitches before the thread stops going back and forth. And that's typically is your needle thread. So the needle thread is being yanked around a lot more. There's more tug on it. So you're more apt to see the needle thread, you know, yanking, if it's too much tension, yanking the bobbin thread up. If your needle thread is showing down under, it's because it's either finer, your bobbin thread is tighter, your bobbin tension is tighter. So then you start playing with tension. But first, make sure you address the needle. Otherwise, it's a losing battle. You, you, your, your thread tension assumes or relies on the proper needle. It cannot compensate for the wrong needle. So make sure you have the right needle and needle size first. If you're getting a lot, getting loops or skip, skip stitches, uh, if you have a small needle especially, first test is check the needle type. If you already verified that, make sure the needle size. So you may want to go up one size of needle. It may address the problem. And then consider tension at the, on the top, fine tune. Okay. Now, uh, so if they are matching threads, that's easy. If they are different threads, so I mentioned Libby Lehman, bottom line thread, very, very fine. Embroidery thread, we use bobbin embroidery thread typically for embroidery. So you have like a 70 weight embroidery bobbin thread or sometimes a 60 weight, uh, you know, people will use as well, versus a 40 weight polyester. There's a tug of war there. So uh, you have to make sure then typically, you're, let's say you're burning a sewing machine, when you go to embroidery mode, a sewing stitch may be a tension of 4.5 units on the screen. You go to embroidery and suddenly it's like 2.5, 2.75, because it knows that for embroidery, you want that beautiful surface thread to be pulled slightly under so the top looks perfect. Right, so some of that is built in, but always test. All right, now as I mentioned, the needle is is first, tension is second. There's only one, and there's only one way to know: it's testing. Uh, in embroidery, in sewing, in quilting, always test. So, uh, you know, if you want to test a combination, like for a quilt stitch, you want a super fine bobbin thread. You want to do continuous, you know, long long quilting segments. You can do a quilt, a quick little sandwich. Play on that. If it works well, you could cut that, put a binding on it, and call it a mug rug, right? So you could always recycle that somewhere else, but always test first. All right. So that's four. Now, machine tips. The thread is all good. You have your favorite threads. You may uh, you may have heard of the thread, like in a class. By the way, right now, classes are limited because of the, the pandemic. But eventually, we'll be able to you know, have more and more in-person classes. So those are a great place to learn because every teacher out there, you know, the stores will bring in a, 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 a special quilter, a quilting artist, or somebody who teaches embroidery, or somebody who teaches you know, garment construction and so on. They will have their favorite threads. So they can help you, you know, understand how that particular thread or threads I mentioned work. Um, I, my, is pretty much my palette. Uh, uh, some of that is organic. Uh, some of that is, you know, because I work for Bernina, we have a partnership, and it's a top quality thread, so I don't have a problem. But I do venture out, and my colleagues all venture out as well. So I'll talk about a few different brands of thread as I go along. Uh, whatever your local store uh, has, and I don't mean the big chain stores, I mean your local sewing store, they have a vested interest in having good quality thread because they want your, you to be successful. Uh, and a, a, a lousy thread will undermine a perfectly good machine. So typically what they carry is you know, stuff that is you know, top notch for your equipment. So talk to your local store. All right, so when you, uh, when you start with your machine, I've said the needle and I could say it 50 times, it's very important. And then avoid jackrabbit starts. I have a little story for you. We, uh, a few years ago, we sponsored a quilt a retreat, a sewing retreat. So we, we brought the machines, Bernina sent a couple of people. I was sent to be, uh, to help basically babysit the machines, facilitate, because some people who take that retreat had never sewn on a Bernina before. So we have two classrooms, two rooms. One has 30 Bernina 350s. That's the little tiny Berninas. Um, they can sew like this, this thick of denim, and yet they're you know, nice and compact, compact and portable. So those are this old oscillator Bernina hook, a CB hook. So we have one room of those. And we have a room of 750s big 10 inch harp modern machines touch screen the whole bit we had orifil excellent thread orifil cotton maco two ply 50 weight both rooms so in the three series room 
and you know those machines are simple. It's push buttons. You you turn it on, it's just straight switch to go. So there's none. There's nothing fancy fancy on the on that machine. So people had fun. We, you know we would just so everything went well. On the seven series room, we kept breaking thread, and I were like, this is weird because I saw on a seven ninety and thread breaks are rare. So I said, what is the deal? There was so I I went between the rooms and then I did a little troubleshooting. So I we we had more thread breaks on the seven series, and turns out. It's a taller machine. And the take up lever, remember the bobbin is bigger. So the thread goes around the loop, the machine picks up that thread. Everything's beautiful, perfect straight stitch. But when people floor the pedal, Berninas have strong DC motors. They will reach, in the case of a 750, a thousand stitches a minute in about 1.2, 1.5 seconds. It's like, you know, it, it, let's say I drive a stick, I drive a manual. If you pump up the engine and you just go, my Corolla doesn't do that, but if you were to do this, you'll burn rubber, right? The materials cannot handle that sudden jolt of energy. So the machine was snapping the thread on the first stitch or two because it was jacking up too fast. If you ramped up the speed, once we figured that out, no more thread breaks. There was no problem with the thread. There was no problem with the machine. It's just that there's a balanced equation between a steel base mechanism yanking on a fiber. Now, Cotton thread, and again, I am not putting down Aurifil here. My colleagues use Aurifil. I've used it on some of my quilts as well. It's great thread, but it's a 50 weight two ply cotton. It's less it's less uh, snap resistant, if you want, than even a 50 weight polyester three ply. In that case, that would be right, or even two ply, because a polyester would 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 flex a little bit before it snaps, so it could absorb that jolt a little better. So the the rule of all of that is no jackrabbits. And I, people so like they drive. I've, I've noticed, I've never seen an exception. If you are heavy footed, I tend to be, I lower the speed slider. And even the three series has that, but I lower the speed slider so I don't run myself into issues. Then it doesn't matter what thread I am. Same, the thread is perfectly fine. There's a limit how much pull or yank, is the, the word I typically use, a, a, a thread regardless of fiber can handle from a steel mechanism pulling at it, right? So that's for that. Now, if you uh, do unbalanced applications, especially embroidery, a uh, bottom line thread for, you know, like a really thin bobbin thread, because you want to have miles and miles and miles, and it's really the top that matters. If that's the case, then there is uh, a variety of options available. Remember the top tension that says it's for fine tuning? That is, that is not, uh, you do not want to reduce your top tension or increase it by a lot trying to just fine tuning a stitch. That's overkill. If you need more tension on the bottom for a fine thread, in the old days, I'm going to show you a variety of um, bobbin cases. And Julie, if I, uh, if I stop sharing my slides, will my camera be bigger? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's do that. All right. Uh, so this, if you have a three series Bernina today, or if you have my 1260, an old, you know, an old Bernina all going all the way back, we used to have a what we call a black latch bobbin case. Notice the latch is not shiny, right? So uh, that's a, that's the one that you could play around with. There's a little screw here that you could adjust and tighten or loosen. We never want you to touch the bobbin case that came with your machine. You don't want a monkey with that bobbin case because it is finely calibrated at the factory so that when you put a 50 or 60 weight thread in there by the way your machine is calibrated to 50 weight nowadays so if you put that 50 weight a metler or orofil or any other brand it's pretty much you know home free so that one is for uh so you can tell it apart and you can play with the screw not only that there's a bobbin case finger right and if you look at the manual for a machine today, you see a little, little hole here. But it actually drilled a hole in the bobbin case finger so you could run the thread through this and get more tension for buttonholes, satin stitch, applique at the sewing machine, and so on. So for embroidery, like on an Aura 440, uh, any machine that does embroidery with one of these, uh, Artista 170, print, uh, regardless, it, the, 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 the manual will tell you to thread the bobbin case finger. So that was kind of built into the hardware. Then we go to the rotary hook. Think Artista 180, uh, you know, the 1630. Well, with the Artista 180, we introduced embroidery. And at first, all we had was a standard, same bobbin case as the uh, Bernina 1630 that introduced a nine millimeter rotary hook, right? The rotary hook made wide stitches, 
possible and sideways motion and all that good stuff. Well, when you want to do embroidery, you need more tension. So, and actually, if you've been at Bernina long enough, you've been on the testing team for some of this stuff. That was very cool. So Bernina decided to add a little piggy tail. So if I put contrast, do you see this little piggy tail in the middle there? Whoops, sorry. See that little piggy tail? And not only that, they first introduced the piggy tail, they changed the shape, we kept testing, no, not quite there, not quite there, not quite there. And then they added even a groove here so the thread could literally find the perfect place on the way to the piggy tail. That's your added tension bobbin case for nine millimeter rotary, you know, the, what we call the rotary hook. So if you have a, a Bernina 640, uh, uh, you know, for embroidery and all that, and this one has a gold latch. So we typically call it the gold, officially it's called the gold latch bobbin case, but we, we call it the piggy tail because it's more obvious to some people. Now, when you move on, we have uh, uh, the eight series was introduced before the seven series, but I'll, I'll do it last. Seven series, uh, let's say my 790, for instance, we now have, they call it gold, it's kind of, you might call it yellow, but they call, we call it the gold uh, bobbin case. It has more tension. And again, it's, it looks different because it's jumbo and it has, you know, all the, all, all the mechanism in there, a little bar for, you know, popping it out and all that. But it's basically a blade, like a conventional bobbin case where the thread tension is effectuated. So there's a screw there. On the regular one, the black one, you don't want to touch that screw because you would mess up your calibration, right? Now your technician has a little uh, devices that they can use to recalibrate a bobbin case. You don't want to go there. So this will add tension, whether you are quilting, whether you're doing bobbin work, you know, like, whether, like sorry, fine bobbin thread, extensive line of work, whether you do embroidery and all that. And I was on the testing team for this. And when I saw the results, I was like, awesome. This one, it really does. So it's the same. We've always had this added tension bobbin cases. On the 8 series, there is no bobbin case. But that hook on your, if you have an 8 series machine, a 20, a 30, a 80 plus, all of them, your, bob, your hook is an industrial hook at the origin. And it's, it's a hook that was adapted to put on the domestic machines. But that hook has been along, along for a long, long time. And it was designed originally for embroidery, free motion, free hand, where you, do, you could do thread painting. And you know that thread painting can actually break needles if you're not careful, where that hook is designed with a guard. If you break a needle, like when you do free motion work, the, the, the needle shard, if you want, will fall into a chute and not hit the hook. It's actually excellent. But since there's no bobbin case, you can adjust tension with that little tool. When you, the little dot, the metal dot on the top, if you turn clockwise, it will add tension. If you go counterclockwise, it reduces tension. There's a wedge here telling you exactly which way will do what. And if you changed it, when you open the door, there's a sticker with a red dot. That red dot was calibrated, verified by a person at the factory, each machine individually. And it will tell you which dot, you need, which, where you need to be on the dots, whether it's perfectly centered, one, one to the left, one to the right, to have the calibrated tension for that individual machine. So you can put it back where it belongs. So wonderful little tool. So that is where you can play with the threads. After that, you have the right needle, yeah, the, let's say if you need to the high tension bobbin case for your series of machine, then you put your threads. Now you can fine tune with the tension all the time. And if it's something you're going to repeat with the touchscreen machines today, four series and up, and even from uh, previous generations, Artista 600 series, 185 and so on, you can save stitches with their settings in the long-term memory. So if you do like freely agree work, let's say like Libby, uh, Libby Lehman would do. If you do filigree work like this, you've calibrated your mix, everything works. You can actually save the stitch with tension and everything into your own term memory. All you have to do is pull the tools when you're ready to do it again, pull the stitch up already to go for you. Okay. Now, there are accessories available. There is a multiple spool holder that hooks up to all the Berlinas, uh, at least from the five series up, and I believe from the four series up, there's a little adapters in the, in, in the box where you put that on the back of your machine. It's like a serger stand, and it will allow you to, um, it will allow you to uh, deliver the threads freely off the spools, okay? Um, let me go back to sharing my, let me go back to sharing my screen. So to recap, the bobbin case, use a multiple spool holder, and save your stitch if you plan on using it again. Now, threading tips, cross wound threads. You know, the ones that, uh, when you go and you see the thread crisscrosses, you know, it, it delivers and it's kind of doing this along the spool as opposed to a stacked thread. Like the old spools were all stacked and I don't think I have a stacked thread with me today because they're less common nowadays. 
So if it's a cross one thread, you want to deliver it horizontally, ideally, except if you have a multiple spool holder, you just pop this puppy down, pull the thread up, you're done. So I like that. It is actually a, uh, it's actually a welcome, official welcome to any embroidery machine in my studio. It gets the multiple threads, thread stand. And if you have one stand, you can actually put the adapters on the different machines. You can move the stand around from machine to machine because it actually snaps on the base as opposed to being bolted to your machine you can you can take it off easily so you can take it from machine to machine if you want to so that will save you a little money uh the stack threads the ones that you know coil this way they need to be delivered uh i don't have the right spool uh, they need to be delivered with the spool standing up because those they tend to have a tight loop and they can actually come off and kink and when they come off so and uh, you'll see on different machines there's a little hole or an, ex an extra guide to guide those threads through again if you have the multiple stand that thread is pulled up and released and freed from its spool regardless before it enters the machine so that that's a neutralizer it, i love it because everything is super easy that way now if you have some of those threads that have the coiled you know the stacked threads some of them had that still have that little i call it the little bite you know the little slit at the at the base of the spool make sure even if you deliver vertically with a spool stand uh, thread stand rather make sure that slit is at the bottom so it doesn't catch that thread on the way up don't ask me oh i know i made that mistake early on so that's for that uh if you have larger cones the thread stand the multiple spool holder will accommodate these so that's good if you have a really really large cone like for quilting threads sometimes people buy the commercial ones uh then you know that those vertical stands the big rod you can actually use one of those. I use it at the, near the hand wheel on my machine. So when the thread comes off of there, it lines right as if it came off the machine itself, right into the entry point, the thread gather at the back of the machine. So that I still have a couple of those and I use them because from some applications, they are the right thing for me, okay? Um, so when the key thing though, when you use a thread, and I, I just saw this last week actually, somebody was having a, a thread uh, one of my colleagues called it thread throw up. The, bobby, the needle thread was getting spooled down under and it was a mess. When you see a lot of thread bunching on the bottom, the first inclination is to think it's the bobbin. It's actually the needle thread usually that does that. And that means it's not intention. So when you thread your machine, make sure your presser foot is up. Now the new machines, we I get lazy. When I cut the thread with the thread cutter, it lifts the foot for me that it's done. When the foot is up, the tension discs get open. And you know when you get the, the back of your machine you take the thread towards you and then it goes down and around the, the the check spring well when you're about to go down you're passing the tension disc right the old machine was easy to see that's where the little gray or white wheel with a red mark was where you check you check your tension you have two tension discs and there's a little floating metal separator in between if you cannot see a gap between the separator and the disc and if, if the, if the floater in the, the the thread separator that little separator is for uh, double needle work to a needlework. If it's not floating, you know, if you touch it and it's fixed, your tension discs are closed. You can in threading that way, the thread will sit on top of the tension assembly and will not go in the tension. So it will stay on top. It will zero tension. That's a that's a guaranteed boo-boo. So always start with the, the foot up. I use the freehand system on all my machines. It's I, I, I am crippled without it because I use it for everything. Start, stop, sewing, threading, because I push my leg. That lifts the foot, opens the tension, start threading. As soon as I pass the tension disc, I let go of the knee lever. It closes my tension disc. I now have tension. I can now thread with one hand. My, you know, we always say keep tension on your thread. Well, as soon as I pass that, I can let go of the left hand, for instance, and I can thread, keep threading with the right hand, or left hand, vice versa, if you are uh, left-handed. So, the, and that does two things because when I pass that tension assembly and let go of the freehand system. I tug. I know I have tension. And so now I'm good. I verified. I can so I can trust my machine, my thread, everything is good. All right. So uh, for extra heavy decorative threads, um, I did a serger pillow project um, that had 12 weight or a filled 12 weight cotton. Oh, it's beautiful stuff. It feels like butter. It's soft. It's awesome. On the top. You know what? 12 weight thread in the sewing machine needle? Mm -mm, no. I, I did not even want to go there, but in a overlocker looper, it's butter. It's really great. So your overlocker is actually an embellishment machine if you let it be. So if you allow it to be. So if you want to go super heavy on a sewing project, now on top of a quilt, not so much, but actually you can do flat lock and you can literally 
is, is, is tied down, a very heavy thread, it will loop around, but if you stack it, it will look almost like a satin stitch when you're done. You can go super wide with a super heavy thread on top, on the surface of a sewing project with your overlocker. So that's when I would depart from the sewing machine and literally go uh, to the overlocker on the side and give it center stage. Okay, thread storage, very important. Thread storage, uh, polyester thread, secondary, but a couple of things. You, the, the, the one rule is you want to keep it in a cool, dry, dark place, kind of your pantry. Think of it as your thread pantry. Um, I, I keep mine in drawers. I know the cute little racks on the wall look great. And if you go through a lot of thread, yeah, 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 because you can pull your threads. If you're a thread junkie like me and you want to play and try different things, awesome. But if you're going to park a spool of cotton thread and there's a window in my sewing room, there's a south exposed window. And I don't like, I don't like closing the blinds. I like the sun. So if the sun beams on that thread every afternoon in about half a year or a year, that cotton thread, silk thread even, would be damaged. So I use drawers. And then I just basically pull up and then my thread keeps fresh that way. Even cotton thread will last a long time. Uh, and also if your thread is outside and it's not, you know, it, there's no cabinet or anything above it, any dust, any dust floating in the room will, tend, will deposit some on your thread. Well, the thread itself can generate lint through the machine. The thread will definitely shed any accumulated external lint dust, because dust is really lint, right? Will shed that into your machine as you pass it through. So uh, your thread is better kept in a drawer. I wish, I wish those old jewelry store drawers would be available. You know, you know, I, what I use for my isocore thread, for instance, is the plastic drawers. I think the brand is Iris, those six little plastic drawers. I have two little towers, 300 and some spools. The whole palette is in there and I've organized it by, by uh, color number. They tend to be color families as well, but not strictly. But by color number, I know that if the 5000 series is in this drawer, the 6000 is going to be in the next drawer type of thing. So I can go that way, but I keep my thread in drawers. If, if it's a deeper drawer, you can do stacks. Get plastic trays and do stacks that way. That works. Um, I know that the, the drawer organizers are great for that. Uh, there's even the narrow ones, they actually match pretty much the size of these guys. So I have a, I have a couple of drawers organized that way. So make sure you don't leave your, your thread exposed to the sun. For sure, that's the worst. That will degrade your thread. Okay. So in summary, uh, well, before I go there, actually, um, let me give you a little uh, overview of the threads that my uh, colleagues reported using. I, 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 there's no time to cover all the threads, all the brands, all the applications. But uh, let me show you a few. So Metler, of course, silk finish, cotton, 50 weight. Uh, 50 weight three ply, very strong. Or there's Aurafil 50 weight cotton, so same weight two ply. That, for piecing quilts, there's uh, NIP quilts at stitch length 175 for regular quilt cotton. So that they're both stronger than they need to be, so there's no issue there. It's really what's accessible to you. Uh, the metal you can buy even in cones, uh, you know, larger volumes if you want, or if for smaller colors, you know, for smaller loads, you can get this size. The, uh, the Orifil is available uh, in the, these large put-up. This is called a European put-up. And if you've ever wondered why you have that little tiny, it's hard to show, that little tiny spool cap on your, uh, in your box with your machine, it is matched exactly to the, side of the, the size of the spool so that when you put this on your machine, delivered horizontally because it's cross-wound, there's nothing between the thread and the machine. There's no spool cap, nothing in the way. So that's what this one is for. And uh, we have uh, polyester as well. For embroidery, I use isocord, 40 weight. I, do, I use isocord for a whole bunch of stuff. I hem my jeans with isocord. And if you need, by the way, isocord embroidery, if you need a smaller size, there is a, a brand from Mettler. Remember, isocord is a brand of Amman Mettler. There's a brand called Polysheen. It is the identical same thread, same color numbers, same everything, but it's available in the small and medium spools. So you don't have to buy a, a thousand meters, like 1100 yards, when you need only a little bit of a pink to finish, you know, a shading or something, right? So if your local store carries polishing, that's, that is your go-to for little details that don't require a big spool, okay? Uh, monofilament, I talked about polyester versus uh, nylon. For most applications, like if I want to do a blind hem and I really don't want any chance of the thread showing, I will use the polyester. 
I can pr I can use a, a moderate iron on it and not stretch or melt it. If I want to do a hand look stitch, the nylon monofilament tends to stretch a little bit, and that hand look stitch on a, you know that's been on Berlina since the 90s, it re it relies on stretching the monofilament to pull a 30 weight bobbin thread up and over backwards to give it the look of a hand look stitch. So I can I have a use for both. Right? Choices are good. For bobbin thread for embroidery. I use, uh, this is OESD uh, bobbin thread, and it is uh, basically close to a 70 weight uh, thread. It's low grade thread, if you look at it. I would not sew with this. It's slubby, it's fuzzy. So as a sewing thread, you may look at this and say, ooh, terrible. But that slight slubbiness, and I say slight slubbiness, it's not, it's not like gross, it's not completely misshapen thread. But that slight slubbiness means that when your embroidery needs to tie in the first stitch, the embroidery needle thread and the bobbin thread snag each other and it locks down the stitch right away. So that works well for me. If you want to do continuous bobbin thread, I've mentioned the bottom line. Bottom line is great for that, for continuous uh, bobbin work, you know, bobbin based uh, thin thread. Uh, but my last quilt was uh, all cross stitch. 136,000 jump stitches, I said, right? Which means there was a 272,000 you know, lock, uh, tie off, hit, cut, and then tie in and continue. That's over a quarter million times in a five by seven feet quilt. The bottom line is very, very slick. It's actually very similar to the, what we used to call lingerie thread. It's a very, very thin polyester, very slick. It's beautiful for continuous filigree type or continuous bobbin work. But Sorry, not bobbin work, but uh, continuous work that requires a long miles of bobbin thread. But for frequent thread interruptions, thread cuts, it doesn't tie in and tie off as well. It's slick. What makes it wonderful for continuous work will hamper its ability to tie in securely for embroidery, for repeated cuts and embroidery. So for those, I would use this thread, okay? Uh, there is also, uh, Mettler has like, uh, it's called bobbinet now. It used to be called bobbin fill, that's bobbinet. It's a smaller spool. If you don't use that thread that often, you don't have to buy the 6,000 yard cones, okay? Uh, Surge your thread. It's uh, it's finer, and it is uh, it is not the sturdiest because this surgery thread typically is for the loopers to lay on the top, upper looper, and on the bottom. And if you look at your garments, you don't want thick thread there because it would add bulk to the seam allowances, and you get kind of a lumpy seam allowance in your garment. Nobody wants that. So it's very thin thread. Love the stuff for hemming, like uh, blind hems. If I have it in the right color, like a black, a white, a light gray, uh, it's great for blind hems because a blind hem is not a sewn through hem. The thread it has to have a little flex to it. It's a more flexible arrangement of that hem. So that thread will take it. So after edging the raw fabric, I can blind hem with the same thread and it, 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 that thread will disappear. If it's a wool or fabric that has any loft to it, the thread disappears. I can get just the right bite in my blind hem. So I use it for certain sewing applications, not uh, heavy duty structural sewing applications because it's a fine, not the strongest thread, but it's great for a thread that needs to do the job and stay concealed at the same time. So that's for a, a variety. Now there's times where you go beyond the thread. What if you want to go with a rope, like a, a string? I, I'm not going to go through the whole set of options available there. There are metallic threads, there are like fuzzy threads, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the, the best thing is, Ask your local store and if, ask them if they have a class that will do embellishment. Because that's where you go to the candy store. That's when you go play in the candy store and try different things. And you may decide, you know, I want, I want to use that thread again. For instance, my colleagues quilt with King Tuck uh, from uh, Superior. And if you, if you go to all the manufacturers' websites, websites, they all have the, you know, good information about threads. It's kind of a patchwork, quilt, pun intended, of the information that will give you a good picture when you're done. When I couch, I want to see it. This is called La Espiga, E-S-P-I-G-A, La Espiga. Uh, it's a, it, like a spike in Spanish, right? It is a very nice, it looks, uh, this one is cotton. It looks almost like a giant form of pearl crown cotton, but it's nice, tightly uh, twisted. So it, it's, it behaves. If you use the couching foot number 43, for instance, it is ideal for that one. You can couch with this. You can couch free motion by hand. You can couch on the Bernie long arms. You can use couching foot. 
and literally do couching. Even with the automated system, the Qmatic, you could pre-program a couching pattern and actually have the long arm do it for you, or you can reserve the fund for yourself and just do it yourself. And not only that, uh, I like geometrics. I, my brain is, you know, my brain is a spire graph. So in the embroidery software, I will, I can digitize a intricate geometric pattern that my little brain could not govern my hands to do perfectly. But then with a the couching foot, it will do it in the embroidery hoop and couch the whole thing down. So at that point, I would use a very fine thread in the needle and let the and a matching thread. So it's, let's say maybe a 60 weight if I can find it in the same color. And typically you'll find a color close enough and then you can just couch the whole thing down. So you can take it beyond the needle thread and match the whole thing still. Um, so let's do the recap. In summary, the thread is fundamental, right? It's the basic ingredient to construct anything. So uh, you make sure you buy a quality thread and if it's if, if it's been decades, don't, don't trust it, right? Uh, thread is like candy, play with it. Take a class, it's the best thing you can do and embellishment classes are the best. Um, thread play, to me, that's, you know, that's where I come from. I throw thread at fabric. Uh, if a thread is labeled for a specific application, that would be my first go-to for that application but I won't let it limit me. Uh, for instance, when I do quilting on a quilt sur surface, I like to see the thread. I don't do a lot of free motion quilt yet. I use thread. So I will use, a, a, let's say, a triple stitch, like with the embroidery machine quilted in, in the hoop. I will use a triple st stitch so I can actually see my thread. Uh, some people prefer very fine thread to create texture instead. So whatever the application is, play. But the audition of that thread, as I said before, just stitching, let's say a feather stitch, a complex feather stitch or a honeycomb stitch is a good example uh, on a flat piece of fabric with a piece of stabilizer that will give you the primary effect that thread will have on top of fabric whether it blends in whether it sticks up and out and if you i would even do a triple stitch you'll it's amazing from a 60 weight two ply to a 30 weight three ply how much difference that triple stitch gives you it's the same stitch, but it will look totally different, right? So, uh, but there's nothing like auditioning it, okay? And one thing also is when we test an embroidery, I usually use a, mi a mid color, like a, a mid gray, mid blue, mid green, because if you do a triple stitch again, in white versus pink versus black, it looks totally different in ways you may not expect. And there's no way to predict this. I don't trust myself to predict any of that. I just run a sample out and then I'll, then I'll get it for sure. And if you have a... Uh, if you have an application in mind, test on your representative layers. There is no substitute for testing. Uh, you know, if you find out this is not going to work, okay, fine. Do something else. Try something else. Uh, what works is what you want. You know, this should be a, a de-stressing hobby for us, right? Not a stressing hobby. So if something is not going to work, but I know something else does, I'll, I'll fall back. It's okay. It's okay. The first choice, is not the first wish is not always the best choice. So, and save the stitch. If you have a touchscreen machine today, uh, four series and up, you can save stitches with particular settings. And then uh, if you did a feather stitch and you say, you know, at this thread thickness, it looked best at maybe not nine millimeters, but maybe seven, it's okay. You can save the stitch with tension, everything, balance, everything in there. So that's for saving your time, uh, saving your time down the road. So uh, when uh, remember that for the handouts, you can download all three of them. They're PDFs, so you can open them even on your tablet. And uh, that's for uh, the information. Uh, let's go to questions, Julie. Okay, yeah, we we had a lot of questions, but you answered the majority of them oh, cool. during your presentation. <laughs> so if you do have any other questions, um, you can email them to me. My email is on the, uh, was on the, email that was sent to you with the link for today and then I will answer it or I will forward it to Sylvain. Um, also the recording will be available to you and the handouts on Bernina.com. Just give us a couple days to get that set up. We'll have it on Bernina.com under our learn and create tab. Um, and then we have and this session again at 3 p.m. Central Time. If you want to join us again, you're more than welcome to. Just use the same link to get the invite. And um, we'll be back at 3 p.m. Central Time. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sylvain, for a great presentation. My pleasure.